I've got right now with me Brian Berge, uh, an audio producer, uh, multimedia artist, um, and uh, new media uh, content creator uh, with us to talk a little bit about um, what it's like to work in audio today in the new media world um, and to answer some questions uh, that I hope you will find helpful in thinking about uh, the way you might work uh, in multimedia. So, Brian, thanks for uh, spending some time with us. Yeah, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. So can you describe uh, your job as an audio producer? Maybe talk a little bit about you know, what it's like uh, to do the different types of work you do, and how did you get there? What type of background um, did you get, and, and how did you sort of evolve into uh, sitting in a studio right now? My background in audio production is um, I started off going to school um, at the Art Institute of Seattle um, in the audio production program. Um, in the program at that point, it was kind of a big um, turning point because they were starting to focus on more multimedia-based um, audio production and less on um, music production. Um, but being in at that point, we kind of got a dose of both sides of it. Uh, we were able to learn a lot about the studio work, working with bands and producing and engineering, but um, we're also really um, pushed to work on um, animation projects and voiceover projects and more um, commercial-based applications. Um, before going to school at the Art Institute, um, I had a very strong interest in music and also just um, sound-related um, projects in general. Um, through that passion that I had for that, I really wanted to find something um, that both um, fed to my interest in um, the, the production side of audio, but also through the creative side as well. Um, and I felt that the program was a really good way of kind of um, finding that balance between the two, of working with some more creative projects, but also working with some of the more very like commercial, non-creative projects. Um, so after, uh, after graduating school, um, I, I spent a fair amount of time working in a number of different capacities in the audio world, um, ranging from freelance audio sound design to studio work, um, to audio for video, to pretty much everything in between. Um, and since then have, um, spent a lot of time working in various capacities of the audio world as well, from sound for film, um, to studio production for um, recording artists, to um, I guess what they're calling now new media work, which is content for web and for phone and um, any type of other type of digital device. So, you know, when I ask your job as an audio uh, professional, it sounds like it's kind of, um, you, you're wearing a lot of hats. Definitely. And um, that's something that over the past, I would say, five years has very much changed. Um, you know, when I was still in school and just out of school, it was still an industry where if you were an engineer or an editor, that's primarily what you did, is you were, you know, just doing engineering and editing. But now, um, you know, the way that the industry has shifted, you've had to take on a lot of different roles um, from producing to editing to, you know, creating... Um, multimedia content, you know, video, audio, um, print media, like all sorts of different stuff that you really didn't think you would be involved in, you know, when you're studying audio production. Um, and that's something that just kind of um, became a necessity after the industry started changing over time. Cool. So um, you just mentioned a bunch of different types of, of audio work. How does, you know, sitting down to do a new media project or maybe something that has more of a traditional narrative structure to it differ from working um, with recording artists and doing sort of, um, you know, uh, what do I want to say, uh, nonlinear editing for film and for speech versus um, nonlinear editing for, for music and multi-track recording. Um, there's, there's a lot of overlap in the process um, with both 
those um, things you were talking about. Uh, um, I would say, you know, one of the biggest difference is um, where where the final output is going to be for these projects. Um, you know, keeping in mind um, when you're working on these things, whether they're going to be sent to a phone or to an iPad or uh, experienced online or on a CD or vinyl or, you know, whatever the medium is, I feel like kind of really speaks to the process and um, the decisions you have to make in um, creating that content. So um, where do you do uh, most of your work? It, again, it sounds like you're doing a number of different jobs. It looks like you're you know, sitting in a studio. Is that primarily where you work, or do you have a variety of, of locations? Um, I would say my time is split about 60-40. 40% um, of that time being in my studio here that where I'm at right now, um, and the rest of the time I work on site um, at various locations. Um, that ranges from you know, live music venues to art galleries to um, other recording studios um, more suited for voiceover work and you know, multimedia kind of audio production work um, to everything in between. You know, it's one of those things where with, um, with the way that the technology is these days and how, how portable and convenient it is, you really have to be able to move your equipment around with you and um, be able to kind of work on the fly wherever you need to. What does your schedule look like uh, in any given week? It sounds to me like it's pretty variable, um, but uh, take me through, uh, you know, sort of the highlights of your week. Um, how do you schedule a day um, and how do you schedule your time to be able to, to do all the different things you need to do? Typical work week for me uh, is a seven-day work week and averages between 10 to 14 hours a day. My time is split between um, what's considered the um, nightlife industry in town here and just regular daytime industry. Um, the hours can be very, uh, really varied. So, for example, uh, I generally get up at 8 o'clock in the morning and deal with clients in New York. Um, you know, they've already started their business day. At that right, point. so it's it's already midday for them. Yeah. Um, and so I'll deal with my New York clients, spend a little bit of time in the home studio here working with them. Um, and then usually around noon Pacific time, um, I'll head out into town and basically start my rounds um, with my various clients. Um Luckily for me, my clients are all kind of located on the same block in town here, um, which is really convenient because uh, what it allows me to do is spend an hour or two at one site and then move on to the next site up the street, spend some time there, and um, basically just do a circle. You know, once I get to the last client, I go back to the first client and... That's, that's how it goes so, until so about... So when you're, when you're working with those clients, uh, I mean, I, I, I take it by that circle, they're not giving you work to go do at home. You're like actually doing work with them there and going to the next place and doing work, et cetera? Or, or are right. you taking stops in there to get stuff done in between on your own? Um, it's, a, it's a little bit of both, you know, depending on the project that I'm working on. Sometimes um, it requires being on site collaborating with other individuals um, and definitely you know with a lot of the multimedia work you're working with web designers and um, video production designers and just a number of different people to um, get these tasks done and it involves being there on site with these people um, you know California is a little bit different than um, some other uh, states that I've worked and lived in before um, the technology um, knowledge that I've found in this uh, particular area that I'm living in is, is a little bit lacking compared to some of the other areas. So I, what, I are, what are those other areas? Uh, New York City, um, Seattle. Um, I, I've lived in a number of different states. Mm -hmm. And definitely, you know, the more rural uh, area that you're working in, the more time that you're going to have to spend dealing um, with clients who have a, a lesser understanding of technology. Mm -hmm. um, and that's kind of an experience I've had across the board. 
Um, so, you know, along with doing the audio production things, oftentimes you get taken on as um, a tech person as well. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, having those skills is, is something I feel like is very, very important to add to your resume um, going into any type of, you know, multimedia or new media production based uh, industry. Can you describe a, a particular audio production job that you've done? Um, maybe a job that maybe is like a web type job that assimilates footage um, into some type of story. How's the process like that work from um, start to finish? So how do you get the, the lead on the client to, you know, having your deliver deliveryable done? Okay. Um, so, you know, one of the projects that I'm working on monthly right now is uh, I work for a contemporary art gallery. And every first Thursday, as part of this art walk that we have in town, um, the art gallery puts on um, a performance-based art piece. And this can range from a musical performance to a dance performance to a multimedia performance. Um, so for these events, um, one of my jobs is to basically create a documentation of these events. Um, so this starts generally um, about two and a half weeks before the event. Um, I get in contact with the artist who is putting on this performance and um, we exchange emails about any of the technical um, kind of coordinating that they need done for this performance. And these days, you know, a lot of uh, contemporary art um, has sound and video incorporated into it. So um, a lot of these performances need a lot of um, kind of tech set up with them. So after we get the uh, logistics of their technical needs um, sorted out, um, I spend time working with a group of interns um, who I manage and work with, um, basically getting all of those tech requirements um, fulfilled for the artist. You know, if it's a matter of renting um, sound equipment or video equipment or projectors or you know whatever they need, we we get all that together. Um, once that is done. Um, the day before the performance, the artist comes in um, and meets with me and my team of interns, and we um, basically do a dry run of uh, the performance that is going to be taking place the next day. Um, and what this does is allows us to get a sense of any type of dynamic um, movement or um, sound or anything that's going to happen throughout that performance so we can prepare for um, our video and audio um, recordings. Um, and this is something that uh, I think is really important to kind of note about this is, you know, going into doing um, production for live performances like this, it's really, really key to be able to have a good understanding of anything that could... Um, change throughout the performance you know a lot of these things aren't static you know they have really like dynamic content so things will go from loud to quiet or dark to bright you know within the span of a few seconds and these are things that we really need to have a good understanding of when we're documenting these um these projects so we're prepared to make any changes that we need to make um so after we um we do the, the, the dry run of the performance. Um, we regroup with artists and with interns that I work with and address any issues that we have regarding um, any of the, the tech aspect of the performance. You know, if um, the artist needs different sound, um, sound production or different equipment, we address it at that point. So on the day of performance, we have everything locked down and ready to go. Um, so the day of the performance, um, generally the way that we, we work is we, um, we load in about two to three hours beforehand. Um, we get all of our equipment reset up from the previous day. Um, and we do a check of all the equipment to make sure everything's functioning properly. Um, again, I think this is something that's very key, you know, giving yourself enough time to be able to really, um, have everything ready to go so when the performance goes live you know that your equipment's working you know everything's in line to be able to um, capture the performance as best as you can because um, with performances like this there's no second take you know these are live live performances and you really have to be able to um, get it on the first go mm -hmm. 
Um, so once uh, once the actual performance starts, we um, you know depending on the performance, we have um, a varying um, kind of setup of equipment. Um, sometimes it'll be a single camera and just a line output from a mixing board. Other times we'll have four cameras set up and um, a number of different microphones set up in a space to be able to capture ambient sound or um, sounds related to the performance that aren't necessarily um, the main content mm -hmm. performance. Um, so once we have the performance actually captured, um, there's, I would say, generally about a week to two weeks work in the actual editing process of that. Um, so, so this you're not doing like follow-up interviews with the participants or anything. This is just a document of the presentation. Um, you know, that's something that's it's always kind of changing. You know, we try and make these um, these pieces that we're doing a reflection of um, the performance in itself. So if this is something where um, there's a, where the artist kind of um, encourages people to interact with the performance, which often happens in contemporary art pieces, um, that's something that we really try and um, incorporate into the editing process. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the night of the performance, we will go around and capture interviews with participants or capture um, B footage. Um, mm -hmm to be able to kind of supplement um, some of the, the other video and audio work that we've, um, we've already captured. Mm -hmm. um, and another thing that um, we actually have to do a fair amount um, of times is when an artist comes in with a multimedia piece where they're using video projection and sound, um, we often um, have to link up with the artist afterwards to be able to get copies of this other media that they're using mm -hmm. that we can use to edit in with our, um, our footage. So that can range from, you know, getting, um, MP3 files or sound files from the artist to PowerPoint presentations to, you know, edited movie files, um, and kind of everything in between. Mm -hmm. So, so, uh, so then you said you do about two weeks of editing. Um, what's, what's that editing process, uh, like, is that you, um, in your studio, is that you w with your team back in the uh, art space? Um, generally, I split my time during the editing process. Um, what I'll do is um, I'll start the, the video editing process at the actual um, art gallery um, with their equipment and get that to a point where I have a rough cut. And then once that rough cut's done, it gets handed over to an intern to do um, all of the kind of like final touches mm -hmm. on the cut. Um, and at that point, once we have something um, that's put together and structured in a way where we think it's going to be close to the final version, um, I'll take the scratch audio that we were using and bring that to my recording studio um, to be mixed and processed for the final version of um, the uh performance piece i got you so it sounds like you know the the sort of um you, you sort of set up the structure of what this multimedia asset is going to look like um somebody else does the sort of nitty-gritty video uh detailing um and then you take the final f the the their final version and remaster the audio and maybe touch up the video too yeah or, or yeah okay and then, and then, you know, as that's going, you say that takes about two weeks. Um, so as that's going, you're starting to prepare for the next performance, if I'm getting the timeline right. So it's sort yep. of an unending process. You're always juggling uh, one of those things. Definitely. Great. Uh, thanks. Yep. Any, anything else you want to add to that? Um, yeah, I mean, you know, it... it it can kind of seem like a daunting process when you think about all the logistics and all the different aspects of what you're doing. Um, and at times it can definitely be, um, how can I put this? Um, it, what makes it better is getting into the rhythm of the process. You know, once you get working on projects like this, and especially when you have multiple projects like this going on at, at one time, 
which is often happening with me, you know, like this, this is a constant thing, but on top of this, I'll have like five other performance projects that I'm working on at the same mm-hmm. time. It's all about getting into the flow and cycle of the work and being able to, um, get to this point where you're, um, because you're doing so much of it, you just become super effective at doing it. Um, how, how many projects would you say in addition to this performance project at any given time, uh, you're probably doing? Um, I would say at times upwards of 10 or 12, mm-hmm. um, but it, it varies, you know, sometimes it'll be pretty light where I'll only have, you know, one or two things happening, but mm-hmm. other times there'll be a lot of things happening. So I, I know you also, you know, do, um, you know, you do a lot of this, uh, contract work with clients. Um, but you also do uh, sort of your own personal audio design, um, your, your own audio pieces. Uh, how does working on your own personal pieces differ from working on um, things where they're sort of, you know, the vision is the client's vision? That's a really interesting question. Um, you know, for the longest time, the thing that I think uh, was the biggest difference was that I could take my time with things and be able to really kind of work at my own pace, that, that's really changed. And that's something that has been extremely affected by my um, corporate client-based work that I'm doing. Um, now when I work on stuff for my own uh, personal work, it tends to move at a breakneck speed. Um, and is, is, that, is that because there's so much other work to get done, there's so little time to do it, or just because... Um, you know, you've been working for so much longer now that you can execute your vision more quickly or? I think that, that that's definitely, you know, a big part of it is, is once you start doing this type of work, you know, whether it's audio editing or um, music production or, you know, just creating music in general, um, it, it's, it's like a language of itself. And the more that you speak that language, the more fluent you're going to be with it. Um, and the, the quicker and easier that it's going to come out. Um, so I think that's definitely a big part of it is, um, you know, it, you create these uh, kind of muscle memories with your creativity, and um, it just it becomes a natural response for you after mm-hmm. a, a certain amount of time. Sure. But also, you know, there's only 24 hours in a day. Mm-hmm. Um, so if you want to do your own creative projects, um, you gotta you got to make the time for it, and you got to be able to... Um, finish these projects within the time that you allow for yourself. Yeah. I mean, I can certainly relate. Uh, you know, I've run a, a radio show that you've uh, frequently uh, uh, been a guest on and a participant in, and, and you know, editing those shows, uh, it's the same thing. It's like muscle memory. You get um, so much better over time in editing audio and editing vocals and whatever it might be um, that even though the projects you take on might be of even a larger scope or more complex, it takes much less time after a while because, like you say, you get into that flow, you learn the particular tools that you're using, and even new tools, you know, become, you know, so similar to the previous tools you've used and and so on, yeah. Well, I think, you know, what you just said is really smart because I think that, that, kind of idea is what has dictated this movement into um, the new media realm. Um, you know, now, like in the past, if you were editing audio, you're just editing audio. But these days, um, you not only have to know how to edit audio, but you have to know how to edit video and you have to know how to basically use all these different tools in your toolbox. Um, and it's come down to basically like knowing how to use a computer. Mm-hmm. and expressing yourself and being creative with a computer. And that's the tool, not so much as the audio program that you're using or the video program that you're using. Well, well, I think this actually segues next into something else I wanted to ask you, which is, um, you know, what tools, and specifically like digital software, but also, um, you know, you showed us a little bit of your studio, what do you find yourself using most often to execute your projects? Um, do you use a particular... Uh, multimedia audio video suite, uh, for example, in um, in our COM210 class, we're using the Adobe Creative Suite, uh, Audition for audio, um, Premiere for video. Uh, what what 
what types of tools um, do you like to use, both both hardware and software, uh, but maybe start with software? Um, you know, definitely the Adobe Creative Suite is uh, an industry standard. You know, it's it's something that if you want to work in the audio, video, multimedia industries, you have to know that. Um, you know, if you don't have that on your resume, um, it's very tricky to get hired in this field. Um, now, saying that, um, some of the tools within the Adobe Creative Suite, I, I utilize more than others. You know, the audio applications um, that are used in the, or that are part of the Adobe Creative Suite, um, for me personally, tend to be a little limiting. Mm -hmm. um, but this is just something that's come through using um, a number of different audio programs uh, throughout the years. Um, so you know, you, what, it, what the, programs do you like to use? I mean, my, the specific program that I use is called Ableton Live. Um, and this is a tool that, or a program that's used to, um, it, it's kind of more slanted towards creative people than um, using it as like a, a corporate business tool. Um, and that's what I really like about it is it gives you a lot more flexibility with being able to manipulate sound to achieve different results. Um, you know, people often use Pro Tools a lot mm -hmm. in the recording industry and the multimedia industry, and it's definitely an industry standard. You know, that's another one where um, you have to have that on your resume to be able to, um, you know, get into this field. Um, but it's something I know, and I use it when I have to, but I choose to use other applications um, when I'm doing my own work. So when you're doing... Um audio for video, which I know you do a fair amount of, uh, do you also use uh, Ableton Live for that? Or it, d when you're doing um, the audio for video work, are you using a more video-centered program? Um, generally, when I work on uh, audio for video, um, I switch in between programs. Um, and the two programs I'd say I use the most for that would be... Um, Final Cut Pro and Ableton Live. When you're using Final Cut Pro, I'm, I'm curious if you're using um, Final Cut Pro 9 or 10. It seems like many people are sticking with, with 9, or have you made the plunge? Um, I definitely uh, have not made the plunge. And um, a lot of other of my colleagues um, are in kind of the same boat. And the reason for that is because, you know, these changes that you talk about in the new version are something that um, drastically um, affect your workflow. Mm -hmm. You know, when you're used to using a certain application and a tool to create your product, um, and then the company who makes that tool goes and changes a lot of the different shortcuts and, um, you know, different um, features in the product, it's really hard to... Um, be able to just dive right into that new version. And when you've got your it. cycle of work, you know. Yeah, totally. Um, and, you know, that happens a lot within, um, you know, the new media, audio, video world. Um, you know, the hottest new thing comes out and everybody jumps on the bandwagon for it. But um, it's not always going to be the best tool for, for what you're doing. Right. My, my understanding for, for video is... Um, that uh, many in the video industry are actually jumping ship over to uh, Adobe Premiere or Avid um, in actually dumping Final Cut Pro. Um, but it sounds like many Final Cut Pro shops and, and users are just sticking with Final Cut Pro 9 for now. Yeah, I mean, I think there's definitely a split between the two. You know, I have clients who um, specifically requested... Um, for me to get Adobe Premiere mm -hmm. after the new version of Final Cut came out. Mm -hmm. um, and these are people that have been using Final Cut for a number of years. And I think they just felt like they were being alienated by the software manufacturer um, and didn't want to support them anymore. Hmm. Uh, well, I guess that bodes, bodes well for Adobe. Um, so thinking more back, getting back more to thinking about audio uh, than video, um, when you're doing uh, uh, live recordings um, to capture live sound, um, 
what types of uh, microphones do you like to use? And um, do you also use live for, you know, when you're capturing digitally, if you're not capturing on analog tape? Or do you have a separate uh, suite that you like to use uh, for capturing live audio? Um, or like a handheld it, recorder or, you know, what? It all depends on the application. Um, you know, if it's something uh, where I'm taking a summed output from a mixing console um generally what i'll do is to keep my equipment you know more portable i use a zoom recorder mm -hmm. uh, which is a really really great tool you know the zoom recorder i have i believe it's the h2 and it's able of taking a direct feed from a mixing board and recording it in high quality but or it also i believe it can do a balanced mic as well yeah i can do yeah. a balanced mm -hmm. mic um, but it also has a built-in microphone that's capable of recording um, not only stereo, but also in surround sound, which is great. I mean, to be able to have something that's, you know, about three and a half inches tall by like two inches wide that can do so much is incredible. Mm -hmm. um, but if I'm working on a more kind of elaborate project, um, you know, I definitely still use live for that. Um but my microphones um, change drastically for those setups. Um, I'm not sure if this is something you guys cover in your audio course here or not, but you know, there's a very big distinction between um, microphone manufacturing, um, and that breaks down to what they call a condenser microphone um, and a dynamic microphone. Um, you know, dynamic microphones are able to capture a louder um, sound wave um meaning that their diaphragm is um not as sensitive um and these are really good if you're trying to capture something that's really loud and not having distortion happen um you know you'll see a lot of these on like um live music venue stages um or you know people performing um in a, a, a live band scenario where you've got a lot of possibility for feedback. Um, you know, in a more intimate setting, uh, say you're recording um, uh, an acoustic band that has like an upright bass. Um, for something like that, I would use uh, one of the condenser microphones, which has a very fragile diaphragm. It's capable of um, getting a lot more of the nuanced sound that you hear um, and doesn't necessarily rely on having a very loud source of audio. So if you're recording, um, you know, audio in the street or audio in a studio, are you using the same type of mic for those or do you use different mics? Um, you know, generally in the, in the studio, um, you, you kind of use the full array of microphones. Um, and it, it depends on what you're trying to record. Um, let's say voiceover. For voiceover, um... You could, I mean, for voiceover, you'd use a uh, condenser microphone, um, you know, which is, allows you to get some of the, the more subtle nuances in the human voice. Um, and it's not something where someone has to be uh, screaming for the microphone to be able to pick up a good, clear sound out right. of it. How would you compare the recording side of your job uh, to the editing side of your job? What do you spend more time doing, recording or editing um, and it sounds like you really have to do both well. Definitely. Um, I'd say for me, it's, it's about a 50, 50 split. Um, you know, the record recording one of the, I think, um, with that is you really have to be able to think on your feet. Um, you know, it's, it's a very kind of fast paced environment and you really need to be able to. Um, address situations and issues um, in a very timely manner. Um, you know, recording studios generally cost between, uh, you know, 100 and $500 an hour to be able to use these um, studios. And um, you can't spend, you know, 45 minutes or an hour trying to troubleshoot an issue. It's something you have to really, really be quick with. Um, with the editing side of things, generally you're not doing that in a recording studio unless you own your own recording studio. Um, you're doing it in a DAW situation. Um, and you get a little bit more time to um, 
focus on some of the more detailed aspects of the sound and the, the kind of final composition. Um, whereas with the studio, you really just kind of have to focus on getting um, the sound recorded in a clean, um, in a clean way without distortion or any, um, you know, outside sound. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Uh, would you say one or the other takes more technical skill or is it just two totally different beasts? Well, it's interesting, you know, cause there's a lot of overlapping, um, technical, um, skill needed for both sides. Um, and you're using some of the same, you know, procedures and applications for, for both editing and recording. Um, but I think a lot of it, you know, it, it comes down to um, personality type. When you work in uh, the recording side of um, the, the audio industry, um, there's a lot of um, talent management that you have to do. Mm -hmm. And... You know, oftentimes I hear people referring to it as almost being like a psychiatrist. Um, you know, you're working with people trying to get the best quality um, product out of them. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes people that are very talented, um, you know, they have uh, very strong egos. And as an engineer um, doing recording, you have to be able to... Um, navigate people's egos and be able to kind of see things from different perspectives to be able to work with a, you know, a variety of people like that. Um, mm -hmm. Whereas in the editing process, you know, generally you're working alone or with, you know, a producer um, and it's a lot more um, of a relaxed kind of um, intimate environment. So, you know, you said that you, um, you uh, graduated from the recording Institute uh, of Seattle yeah, um, the, the uh, Art Institute. Of Art Institute of Seattle, excuse me, in in their recording program, recording arts yep. program or something. Um, so that was your, say, formal training, um, and then you've been working for uh, around, you know, a decade or whatever in, in the various um, multimedia industries. How important would you say that formal training is compared to um, doing sort of... Um, just getting your own work experience and you know also considering the the many people you've met who also do um, professional multimedia stuff um, how much value do you place on the formal um, multimedia training and the you know just getting experience and interning and going and doing right um, you know in the industry today um, there's definitely um, a really big emphasis on experience. You know, they really, really want people who have had experience in one way or another um, working in whatever um, you know position they're they're looking to hire. Um, and this is something that's been kind of common in the audio industry for a while. Is um, the way that you gain that experience is um, becoming an intern. You know, the the intern sub industry of the audio recording industry is um it's a really kind of fascinating world um did you uh do an internship i did um you know i was actually interning um at three or four different recording studios while i was in my um my audio recording program so this is in seattle yeah this is in seattle um and when I first got in as an intern, you know, they were like, we don't care anything about your educational experience or the classes you're going through right now. Like we want you to listen to what we have to say and, um, learn from us, which I think is a really great way to learn. You know, you can learn a lot about, um, working with audio and sound, um, through that process. But one of the things that, I, um, I feel like I really gained from being in the audio program was learning a lot of the theory behind um, audio in general. You know, being able to understand um, the physics of sound, mm -hmm. I think is a very important thing um, to being able to um, effectively capture sound. Because um, when you break it down to that level, um, you start to understand 
how the sound is being created and how it travels through air and all of these things that are really important to being able to figure out um, what's the best way to record this sound. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think that was something that was definitely, um, you don't really learn that in recording in studio as an intern unless you have someone that's really like stoked about teaching you that, which is, is definitely uh, pretty rare these days. So as you know, I'm going to be posting this interview for my multimedia content creation class. Um, in our class, uh, you know, we're doing a really broad overview of multimedia content creation, including graphic design, audio production, and video production, which really only gives us a few weeks on each type of, of thing. Um, for example, in this audio unit, we've got three weeks where we're, ta- where we're learning all the tools and, and going out and recording. And um, So as you know, having gone through a whole program dedicated uh, to audio production, we're, we're skimming the surface. You know, I mean... Um, any, any of these students who are going to dive more into audio are certainly going to need to um, um, go on and, 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 and do more of this. Uh, so thinking of that as, uh, thinking of our class as your frame of reference, what were some of the really important tips that you could share with the class um, that really helped you hone your craft? Hmm. That's a good question. Um, you know, relating to audio, I would say the most important things you can learn that's really easy to learn is, you know, picking the right tools for the application. And in this case, um, you know, using the correct microphones for the correct, um, you know, sound that you're recording is, is very crucial. Um, I think another thing that's really kind of key is um, not being afraid to experiment with what you're doing. You know, I, I feel like I've seen a lot of people get locked into this um, mindset where there's one way to do something and that's the only way to do it. You know, like the industry standards of using Pro Tools, you know, definitely like Pro Tools is a really good thing to know. But um, if it's not a program that you like using and feel comfortable using, then explore other programs. You know, there's a lot of other programs out there and a lot of other tools that you can use that um, work better with your learning style and with your approach to this craft. Um, So I think, you know, those two are really important. And also, um, this is something I wish people would have told me um, when I was in school. And they kind of hinted at it, but... um, with audio, um, you've got to you've got to expand your horizons as far as um, what it is that you expose yourself to, um, whether it's music or audio books or you know whatever it is. Like, you need to be hungry to hear different types of things because the only way you're going to be able to um, be put into different situations and be able to strive is to be able to have a frame of reference for those situations. Cool. Uh, so, you know, having gone through as many different types of projects as you have, do you have any other advice for sort of editing and crafting a story gotcha. that, gotcha. that, that, that is able to convey and communicate concisely? Um, do you have any advice uh, in that vein? Definitely. Um, you know, I, I think one of the, the greatest tools that an audio producer has with working um, with a story and a narrative is um, non-linear editing. Mm-hmm. You know, the ability to be able to dynamically move pieces of sound around to see what the result is in real time. You know, I've had so many projects take complete left turns because I accidentally moved this audio chunk, you know, in front of this other one, and it completely changed my project in a positive way. Mm -hmm. You know, these kind of little surprises you can get by um, being able to dynamically rearrange things like that, I think is is really, really cool. Mm -hmm. Um, And it also kind of frees you from this uh, linear narrative based box that you can get stuck in sometimes you know sometimes it, it's really easy to edit audio like you're writing a story but 
you know, with the medium, it, it allows for so much more flexibility. Um, you know, it doesn't just have to be your voice telling a story. You know, you can sprinkle all these different sound effects and different uh, layers of sound onto uh, a vocal recording that add so much um, so much love to it. Yeah. You know, it really changes the the whole the whole narrative once you add um, some just sweetening to it. How did you transition from being um, an audio production student to a multimedia professional? Um, because I know you've you've really you know worn a lot of hats in this new media world. Yet your training was pretty strictly focused on audio. Um, how do you get experience, and then how do you transition into doing what you want to do in, in a tough economy? Uh, yeah, you know um, that was one of the things when I first got out of school. I was dead set that I was gonna, you know, work in a recording studio my whole life, and you know, have this kind of dream experience that um, audio professionals definitely can have um and then uh the floor kind of drops out on you you get out of college and you realize that you have to get a job and you have to pay your rent and do all the things that you know us as adults do and um it's a really difficult transition and i'm gonna be very honest with you it's it's a, a very kind of night and day experience um coming out of college um and the thing that I really kind of tuned into um, when I was applying for jobs or working at jobs was that because the way the economy was what it was, um, people weren't hiring people that just had one set of skills. Um, you know, you kind of had to be um, someone who was able to, one, learn things n new that um, you could do really quickly. Um, but also be able to um, do a number of different things, you know, whether that's doing audio and video or audio and video and web programming or, you know, the more things you're able to tell a client that you can do, the more work you're going to end up getting. Mm -hmm. Sure. And now with new media stuff, like, it's all kind of incorporated together anyway, so... Um, it kind of made sense to me to be able to be able to do all of it myself instead of saying like, okay, well, I could hire these two other people to do this work and then split that three ways. Or I could just learn how to do it myself and take in all of the money. Yeah. Hmm. So do you have any advice for students interested in getting involved in audio production or more broadly in, in audio industries? Um, like what steps they can take uh, aside from, you know, learning broad skills? Um, you know, I think uh, a big thing is never getting to the point in your life or your career where you feel like you know everything. You know, always be open to other people's perspectives and, and learning new things. I think is is a, a big thing for sure. You know, it's it's there's a lot of um cutthroat aspects to the industry. And um I think being able to be the person in that industry that listens to other people and takes other people's critique in a in a good way and is humble in what they do, um, I think really sets you apart from other people in the industry. Has the rise of not just the internet, which you've talked about in detail, um, but has the rise of online social network sites, uh, you know, Facebook and, and the networking that comes along with that, and other communication innovations that have happened uh, more recently, have you seen those uh, impact the audio production uh, and recording industry, uh, and, and how so, if so? Yeah, I mean that's um that's definitely something I've seen change throughout, you know, the last 10 years. Um, you know, I think one of the biggest things that in my lifetime um that, that made such a huge aspect on or 
the, sorry, made such a huge change on um, the industry was um, the MP3. You know, definitely the MP3, um, in a lot of ways, revolutionized the in- industry, but also extremely damaged it. Um, you know, people's ears um, are starting to get used to hearing sound that's not great. You know, that's lower quality, which in turn um, makes our ears start adjust to hearing things in that way, which I think can be extremely damaging. Um, but what that also has allowed is for um, media to be distributed in an in amazing way you know, in ways that we were never able to do it before. And you see that in um, everywhere on the internet, you know, whether it's um, this artist that came up out of nowhere that all of a sudden has a million YouTube hits or, you know, has a million people downloading their MP3. Cool. Uh, Any chance I could get you to uh, do a brief uh, show around for the students of the studio you're in now? This is your personal studio? Yeah, this is uh, it's a, my personal studio that um, I've built and is also um, a space that I rent out to other engineers, producers, and bands to do work in. Um, yeah, let me give you a little uh, little tour here. Thanks. Um, so where I'm sitting right now is in what we call the control room. Control um, room, okay. Mixing board and um, all of the outboard equipment used for the actual recording of audio happens can see here is um, I've got my audio recording desk set up here um, with my monitors and um, my Apple screen here which I think you can see in frame yep um, this is um, I would say where I spend about 70% of my time when I'm working with clients in here um, sitting behind the board um, either mixing or processing sound um, to get it ready for whatever the final um, output's going to be. Um, you can kind of see through this window here. Yeah. Um, that's what we call the live room or the tracking room. And this is where a band or an artist or um, voiceover talent would sit to um, be able to uh, be ready for being recorded. Um we have it set up this way, so uh, when we are recording, there's um, a level of isolation between um, where I'm working and where the artist is working, so we don't get any sounds of me moving around or shuffling around or any type of, type of exterior sounds um, into the actual recording of the work. Um, and let's shift around here a little bit. Um, over here in the corner, there are... They're under uh, blankets right now, but this is actually one of the things that um, I've kind of created a niche for myself in the community here with is um, my studio is all analog. Um, And this is something, again, that I've kind of uh, had to do out of necessity um, because there's a lot of recording studios and a lot of production studios in town here, but um, a number of them many years ago um, got rid of their analog equipment. So so what do you have Um, under the blankets there? Uh, I've got a 24-track uh, analog tape machine, and I've got a 4-track um, analog mastering machine. And uh, this equipment is used to take the sound that's being fed from the live room um, in through the mixing board, and then we go directly to analog tape. Cool. That's a really that's a that's a cool studio. Um, that's all the questions I have. Uh, first of all, I want to really thank you for your, your you know generous giving of your time sharing information uh, with us. Uh, is there anything else you'd like to add? Anything, you know, that, that you wish we talked or that you wished or that we would have talked about or, or you wish you would have um, known when you started your journey into audio and multimedia stuff? You know, I, I think the biggest thing I can suggest is just do in life what you're passionate about. You know, we're only on this planet once, and um, you've got to spend your time 8, 10, 14 hours a day doing something and getting paid for it. Have it be something that you really love doing um, because it makes such a huge difference, you know, waking up every day and being excited to start your day. 
and being excited and passionate about the things that you're doing in your life. Um, I think that's something that is often um, underestimated in our culture, the importance of. All right. Well, uh, thanks a lot, Brian. Yeah. Thank you.